Welcome to the Responsibilities module of the RSO Required Leader Training. In this module, we'll cover issues related to risk management, off-campus events, and travel, the Office of Student Conduct, Title IX, and the Clery Act. Slide two. Early in the planning process, ask yourselves this important question. Does this event fit the mission and visions of my organization and of UNLV? This fundamental question should guide you in the decision-making process as you proceed. If you can't advocate strongly enough for why your plans fall in line with these missions and values, it's probably time to reevaluate and develop a new plan that does. Slide three, let's go ahead and get started. First, with risk management. Slide four, what is risk management? Risk management is the process of identifying, analyzing, and mitigating potential risks. RSOs need to be aware of the potential risks of events you are planning and work to develop strategies to mitigate those risks. Risks can vary in type and scope, but must be accounted for in your planning processes. Risk management is important because the safety of your members, the UNLV community, and any person you interact with is very important. The key is to be proactive. Make sure you're thinking ahead and putting in place all of the safety measures you can ensure your event goes as smoothly and safely as possible. Slide 5. When considering the potential risks associated with your event, there are several factors that can inherently increase the likelihood of harm or loss and should be strongly considered in your decision making. These include traveling, the consumption of alcohol by participants, events with a physical activity such as playing a sport or use of a dunk tank, off-campus events, contracts, or agreements with third-party vendors, the behavior of the organization members at parties or social events, and fire or other life safety issues. Slide 6. This training will utilize a case study to demonstrate the steps of identifying and planning for risk, including identifying the hazards, assessing who might be harmed, and how, evaluating the risks, developing and implementing a mitigation plan, and post-event assessment. Slide 7. A risk management matrix is a tool that allows you to assess the risk of any event by indexing the severity of harm against the likelihood it may occur. In a perfect world, you'd eliminate all risk when planning your events, but that isn't always possible. The goal of a risk management matrix is to help you identify risks and to maintain an acceptable level of risk. The top of the matrix asks you to identify the likelihood that negative outcomes may occur. The left side of the matrix asks you to determine the severity of potential outcomes. As you identify each element of your planned event, use the matrix to identify the level of associated risk as either low medium, high, or extremely high. For example, based on this chart, you identified that the likelihood of a negative outcome at your event falls in the seldom category, and the severity of potential negative outcomes is marginal. Then your level of risk, as per the matrix, is medium. If, however, you identified that the potential likelihood was frequent, while the potential negative outcomes were critical, the matrix identifies your risk as extremely high. High risk activities should be avoided whenever possible. For medium and low risk events, methods to mitigate those risks should be identified and implemented. Slide eight, let's talk to our risk management case study. Say your organization is planning an outdoor event on the rec center lawn to celebrate the start of the semester. Because the event will take place in a venue that's managed by student union and event services, referred to moving forward as SUES, you have been assigned an event coordinator to work with during the planning process and on the day of your event. A student member of your organization plans to DJ the event using sound equipment rented through and set up by SUS. Additionally, you plan to play lawn games, including cornhole and giant Jenga. You have also worked with a third party off campus vendor to secure the use of an inflatable bounce house at the event. Slide nine. Based on this event, let's complete the risk mitigation plan together. On the first row, we list our student DJ as an event element. The SUS rented sound equipment and a table for the DJ will be placed under a pop-up canopy provided by your organization. What are the potential associated risks? Though you plan to locate the DJ as close as you can to a power outlet, the cords still have to run a short way through the grass so there is a risk that someone could trip, fall, and injure themselves on the electrical cords. In addition, pop-up canopies have the potential to lift and blow away in high winds, which could cause injury or mild property damage. Based on the risk matrix, we have identified that the trip hazard of the power cords as well as the risk of the pop-up canopy blowing away in high winds both present a medium level or risk.
To reduce these risks, we plan to mitigate these risks by placing the DJ station as close to a power outlet as possible and then covering the cords that run from the outlet to the sound equipment with cable guards or brightly colored cones. In addition, the RSO plans to provide sandbags to weigh down the legs and feet of the canopy to reduce the possibility it could be picked up by high winds. We have also developed as a backup plan that we will not set up the pop-up canopy if the winds are high the day of the event, or we'll take the canopy down if the wind picks up too much. Click. The next element of the event is the inflatable bounce house that's being rented by a third-party off-campus vendor. Individuals who are jumping in the bounce house risk minor injuries such as a sprained ankle. Again, winds could be a factor in this event, which are dangerous with inflatable bounce houses as they can be picked up and blown across the field, posing the risk of a more serious injury if someone is inside at the time. The rental is inflated via a small generator, which could also pose the risk of guests inhaling fumes from the gas that powers the generator. Based on the risk matrix, we identified the risk of injury from the use of the bounce house as well as the fume inhalation both pose medium levels of risk. The potential of high winds that blows the bounce house over poses a high risk. To reduce this risk, we plan to follow all safety guidelines provided by the bounce house vendor. Ahead of the event, we will provide a copy of the inflatable vendor certificate of liability insurance that meets the requirements set by our SUS event coordinator. The vendor is required to provide heavy weights for the bounce house to reduce the risk it could blow over. We will also plan to supervise the load-in and setup of the bounce house with our event coordinator on-site to ensure the vendor follows the agreed-upon safety protocols. The generator will be placed in an area with open ventilation and a wide circle of brightly colored cones will be placed around it to ensure participants don't stand too close to the exhaust fumes. Lastly, we identify now that our backup plan, if winds are determined to be high, is to not utilize the bounce house. Slide 10. The next event element on our risk mitigation plan is the outdoor lawn games that include cornhole and giant Jenga. Potential risks include the possibility that the Jenga pieces fall on a participant or that someone could be hit by a beanbag from the cornhole game. Based on the risk matrix, we identify the risks of these to be low. To mitigate this risk, we plan to place these games on an area of the field that doesn't encourage guests to walk through it to get to other event elements. Click. The last event element on our risk mitigation plan is related to the heat early in the fall semester, which we note could cause heat exhaustion or dehydration. Based on the risk matrix, we identify the level of risk to be low. Plans to reduce risk include providing water to attendees. In addition, organizers will keep note of anyone who looks like they may be feeling the negative effects from the heat and bring them inside to sit down in the SRWC lobby until they cool off. Click. Note that because we have identified that this event does have several elements where risk exists, all participants are required to sign a liability waiver. Once signed, each attendee will be given a wristband so event organizers can identify that they have completed the required waiver. We'll come back to liability waivers in more detail soon. Slide 11. So, it's the day of your event. You're all set up and ready to go. 30 minutes before the event is scheduled to start, you notice that the weather has turned. The sun that was shining has now disappeared. Clouds have rolled in and the wind is gusting very strong, maybe even as much as 30 or 40 miles an hour. The vendor already set up your bounce house as per the safety regulations and you'll be obligated to pay for it whether you use it or not. Now here's the question. Should you continue with your plans and allow participants to use that bounce house? Again, think about our earlier point on identifying risk, not only beforehand, but throughout the full event. Is it still a good idea? Click. The answer to that question is no. The change in weather means that the risk is now too high to continue with the original plan. Someone could be seriously injured if that bounce house were to be picked up and rolled across the lawn because of the strength of the wind. Sometimes being the leader in your student organization includes making difficult choices. It's possible that everyone knows the bounce house is going to be there. They're excited to utilize it. You know you're going to pay for it whether you use it or not. But the best choice you can make as a leader in that moment is the difficult one not to utilize it. Slide 12. Liability waivers. If you identify any possible risk associated with your event, all participants must complete a liability waiver. 
RSOs must use the standard template provided by UNLV Risk Management and General Counsel. Templates are available on the Student Involvement and Activities website at unlv.edu backslash SIA backslash student hyphen orgs backslash registration backslash understanding hyphen risk hyphen management. RSO leaders are expected to store signed liability waivers for four years post-event. Some common activities that should always utilize liability waivers, anything that includes off-campus travel, rental of inflatables, physical activities or games, handling any chemicals, etc. Really think through the planned activities for your event. The liability waiver needs to inform all participants of the potential risks associated with the event. Slide 13. As per the RSO manual, student organizations are considered separate entities from UNLV and may not act as an extension of the institution. Student organizations do not have the authority to represent UNLV and are not able to sign contracts with off-campus venues or third-party vendors on behalf of the institution. Faculty and staff advisors are also not permitted to sign any contracts or agreements as representatives of UNLV on behalf of your organization. Should a member of your organization choose to enter into a contract or agreement as a representative of your RSO, any individual who signs that contract may be held personally responsible for the contract, indebtedness, obligations, and liabilities. This means that the responsibility to uphold the contract, pay for the agreement, and assume any liability falls on the organization and the students who sign the contract and not on UNLV. Students who do choose to enter into these agreements are advised to do so under extreme caution and care for the written content of the agreement. If your RSO is part of a national organization, it is recommended you consult with representatives from the national level before entering into any agreements on behalf of the organization. Slide 14. UNLV has adopted new guidelines for RSOs related to off-campus events and travel, so pay attention as the next few slides may be new information. These guidelines are designed to promote student safety. Slide 15. An event is considered an RSO event if social media and other marketing indicate it is an RSO event, if a significant number of attendees are members of the RSO, if you are using RSO funding received through university funding processes or RSO-generated funds in an RSO commercial bank account for the event, if others could reasonably infer it's an RSO event based on event signage, participant attire, or social media. Meaning, if students post about being on an RSO ski trip, it is an RSO ski trip, not a group of students that went skiing that happen to be members of the same RSO. Same thing if people post about being at an RSO party. So if it looks like an RSO event, it is an RSO event. Slide 16. Off-campus events should be held at venues that allow entry to persons of any age, so this would exclude any locations that require all individuals to be 21 or older to enter. This makes the event more inclusive and also ensures requirements for having food and non-alcoholic options are met. When engaging in a high-risk activity, such as rock climbing, skydiving, or axe throwing, use a reputable licensed business that has insurance for the activities and trained professionals who ensure adequate safety measures are in place. To ensure student safety and to help manage the risks, RSO should use reputable licensed companies for any activities that require training, expertise, and safety equipment. For example, if you plan a ski trip, you should utilize a licensed ski resort and follow all resort rules such as skiing and bounds. The maximum occupancy for any indoor and outdoor space needs to be observed, and RSOs need to have a way to manage access to events in which more individuals may want to enter than fire and life safety guidelines allow. Please keep in mind that the Student Conduct Code applies to all RSO activities, whether they occur on or off campus. Slide 17. Alcohol at events increases the risk for the events. For events with alcohol, RSO should utilize a third-party vendor that is responsible for checking identification of participants and serving alcohol in accordance with state and federal regulations and laws. RSOs must not permit, encourage, coerce, glorify, or participate in any activities involving the rapid consumption of alcohol, such as drinking games. As a reminder, RSO events held on campus must follow the UNLV alcohol events policy and must receive prior approval from the Vice President for Student Affairs.
<sighs> Slide 18. Travel is another activity that increases the risks, so RSOs need to take steps to minimize the risks associated with travel. One student who is traveling with a group must be designated as the trip leader that is responsible for ensuring safety protocols are followed and maintains a roster of trip participants, copies of liability waivers and emergency contact information, and enacts emergency procedures. Liability waivers must be completed by all individuals traveling. It is suggested RSOs create a Google Drive of travel itinerary and liability waivers that is accessible to members on the trip, but also to a responsible person not going on the trip, so that if an emergency occurs, there are multiple people that can access the needed information. International travel must be coordinated through the Office of International Programs and may have additional requirements. RSOs are encouraged to fly with a licensed commercial airline or rent a bus van, or large vehicle with a fully licensed professional driver. Utilizing professional travel services reduces the risk. Slide 19. Travel by private vehicle has many risks that need to be managed. Individuals utilizing their own vehicle to transport others and individuals driving others need to be aware of the personal liability. Any parking fines, motor vehicle infractions, or other liability charges are the personal liability of the driver. All private vehicles must have insurance covered as required by law. All students who operate motor vehicles during travel are required to have a valid U.S. driver's license for the vehicle being driven with appropriate classifications, restrictions, and or endorsements. All vehicles must have a responsible person in the front passenger seat to assist with navigation. This navigator is expected to remain awake at all times. Drivers must not use cell phones while driving unless a hands-free device is used. Trips requiring more than 10 hours of driving time round trip must include overnight lodging. For trips more than 350 miles each way, two valid drivers are required per vehicle, and the drivers must rotate every three to five hours. Driving overnight is prohibited. Itineraries may not include more than one hour of drive between midnight and 6 a.m. Slide 20. Even with a rock-solid risk management plan, sometimes accidents, incidents, or injuries occur. In this next section, we will cover RSO responsibilities should there be an emergency. Slide 21. What should you do if an accident occurs at one of your events? First and foremost, take immediate care of any injuries, medical issues, or other safety emergencies. This could range from getting ice for a participant who rolled their ankle to calling 911 for a life-threatening medical incident, fire, or auto accident. The next step would be to document the incident in as much detail as is possible. Create a written record of exactly what happened. Be sure to get accounts for all who were involved. Document the incidents with pictures and or video when appropriate. In addition, the incident should be reported to UNLV. If it is during business hours, you can contact the Student Involvement and Activities Office at 702-895-5631. Outside of business hours, contact the UNLV Police Services Non-Emergency Line at 702-895-3668. Be prepared to provide a detailed account when reporting. A written report must be mailed to involvement at unlv.edu within 12 hours of the incident. If it is a serious incident, be sure to call UNLV as soon as possible as you are able and send the email of written information as soon as possible. Slide 22. In this next section, we'll talk about the Office of Student Conduct. Slide 23. The Office of Student Conduct, also known as OSC, promotes the awareness of student and student organization rights and responsibilities. The Student Code of Conduct can be found online at unlv.edu slash studentconduct. It's important to note that anywhere in the Student Conduct Code, when it refers to a student, it actually reads student slash student organization. That means that all of the rights and responsibilities an individual student has listed in the code also applies to your student organization. Any student or student organization may be held accountable for the actions of any of its members if the violation of the code is in any way related to the organization. Organization misconduct does not need to be officially sanctioned by the entire membership to be considered grounds for possible conduct action towards the organization. 
Remember that the actions of even one member can have an impact on your entire organization if they're acting on behalf of your organization. Slide 24. The University of Nevada, Las Vegas defines hazing as any method of initiation into a group performed by someone on or off campus that endangers another individual, destroys or removes public or private property, or subjects someone to mental or physical requirements, requests or obligations that endanger another individual, could cause discomfort, pain, fright, disgrace, injury, or that is personally degrading, or violates any federal, state, local law, or university policy. An instance only has to meet one of these definitions in order to be considered hazing, not all of them. Just one. Also, the willingness to participate in hazing does not make the conduct acceptable or legitimate. Slide 25. The line of what does and doesn't constitute hazing can sometimes be very hard to discern. If you're not sure if something is considered hazing, start by asking yourself these questions. Would I still participate if my family were watching? Am I expected to keep these activities a secret? Is this illegal or does it violate UNLV policies? Does this violate my personal values or those of the organization and or UNLV? Is this causing emotional or physical distress to myself or others? Would we worry about the consequences if a UNLV administrator saw this happening? Often, just the pause and need to ask yourself these questions may be what tells you that what's happening isn't right. Slide 26. Hazing occurs on a spectrum that is centered around two principles, recognition and frequency, and three actions, intimidation, harassment, and violence. There's a wide range of behaviors that fit the definition of hazing. For this reason, it can often go unrecognized and unreported. The spectrum of hazing illustrates the reality that the most violent forms of hazing, such as the forced consumption of alcohol, drugs, or vile substances, or beatings, occur at a lower frequency, but are highly recognized. Whereas intimidation hazing, such as demeaning names or expecting items to always be in one's possession, or harassment hazing, which includes verbal abuse or sleep deprivation, happen far more frequently, but are often not recognized as harmful hazing behaviors. Increasing the awareness of these low-recognition, high-frequency intimidation and harassment forms of hazing can reduce our community's tolerance of such behaviors and shift the culture towards more positive, less harmful ways of welcoming new members into your organizations and engaging with existing members. Slide 27. Remember that the Office of Student Conduct is here as a resource for you. Reach out to OSC to request a training for your student organization members. Remember that if something your organization is doing gives you reason to pause, listen to your instincts. If you're not sure if the activity represents a positive choice for your organization, don't hesitate to reference the conduct code or reach out to the Office of Student Conduct. Information about OSC can be found online. Slide 28. Next, we're going to talk about the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act, also known as Title IX. Slide 29. Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972 states that, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational programs or activity receiving federal financial assistance, end quote. Title IX provides gender equity in athletics, prohibits gender-based discrimination of students and employees of the university, and prohibits sex discrimination, including sexual harassment and sexual violence. Slide 30. UNLV prohibits gender discrimination in any form, including sexual harassment or violence towards students, faculty, or staff. UNLV requires all students, faculty, and staff to comply with this policy. UNLV has also designated a department to coordinate efforts to comply with Title IX mandates, provide supportive measures, and investigate complaints known as the Office of Equal Employment and Title IX. You can also find them online at unlv.edu slash compliance. Slide 31. Gender discrimination is the unequal or disadvantageous treatment of an individual or group based on their gender, but not necessarily sexual in nature. This includes discrimination based on sex, gender identity, or gender expression. There are many examples of discrimination that are listed here, but the one we really want to point out is what's bolded, extracurricular activities. 
anybody who takes part in a student organization on campus is part of an extracurricular activity and is therefore required to follow the mandates of Title IX. Slide 32. What is sexual harassment? It's defined as an unwelcome conduct on the basis of sex that is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the institution's education program or activity. It can include, but is not limited to, sexual advances, sexual assaults, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Sexual harassment can be based on an individual's perception of the event in question. This is very important to note. If the conduct is unwelcome and offensive to the person experiencing, then it could be considered sexual harassment, regardless of whether or not it was intended that way. It doesn't matter if it was only meant to be a joke or if someone didn't intend for someone to be hurt by it. If that individual who is experiencing it finds it to be unwelcome and offensive, then it may be considered sexual harassment. Slide 33. What is your responsibility? Everyone on campus is responsible for preventing sexual harassment and ensuring that the organizations you are part of are free from harassment. It's also your responsibility to become informed about what constitutes sexual harassment as well as bystander interventions to prevent it. We also encourage you to evaluate your own behavior to ensure that you are not engaging in sexual harassment. As a leader in your student organization, it is your responsibility to create an environment where sexual harassment and violence are not tolerated in any form. It is also your duty to report violations on campus when you are aware of them. Slide 34. If you believe that you or another individual on campus have been the victim of sexual harassment, including sexual assault, violence, or other sexual misconduct or gender discrimination in any form, you are encouraged to report it. There are several ways in which you can report sexual harassment, violence, or misconduct. You can reach out to the Office of Equal Opportunity in Title IX, including filing an online report form available at unlv.edu slash compliance the Office of Student Conduct, Police Services, Housing and Residential Life, the Care Center, Student Involvement Activities, or any other UNLV faculty or staff member. Note that all UNLV faculty or staff members, excluding those covered by a doctor's privilege or serving as legal counsel, are considered mandatory Title IX reporters. This means if you tell your advisor about something that has occurred, by law, they are required unless they are covered by doctor's privilege or legal counsel to report that back to the university. Should this happen, the university's Title IX coordinator would contact you to offer supportive measures. Slide 35. An important resource for you to know about is the Care Center. The Care Center provides free and confidential support services, holistic healing workshops, campus education, and awareness events for UNLV, Nevada State University, and the College of Southern Nevada communities impacted by sexual assault, relationship abuse, family violence, and or stalking. Programs and services are available to people of all identities and regardless of status. Care advocates can assist in the process of working through feelings, identifying needs, and making decisions. Note that services are available even if the event occurred off campus and regardless of your gender identity or sexual orientation. If you or someone you know has been harmed, please call the care line. Slide 36. Next, we're going to discuss the Gene Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Crime Statistics Act, also known as the Cleary Act. Slide 37. What is the Cleary Act? Unfortunately, the Cleary Act has a pretty sad story associated with it. The Cleary Act is named after Jean Cleary, who was sexually assaulted and murdered in her dorm room by another student at Lehigh University in 1986. After her death, her parents discovered there was a high rate of violent crime at Lehigh and that this information was not disclosed to the public. Her parents were adamant that, had Jean known of the crime rate, she would have been more cautious on campus. In response, her parents lobbied Congress to enact legislation. The Cleary Act requires institutions of higher education to disclose crime statistics to current and prospective students and employees to ensure that they are informed about campus crimes and to allow them to make informed decisions. Slide 38. 
This federal policy mandates the compilation and disclosure of campus crime statistics and requires the collection of information regarding incidents from non-law enforcement agents known as campus security authorities. The Cleary Act requires colleges and universities to disclose certain information about campus crimes and security policies. Institutions that fail to meet these requirements can be fined and lose federal funding. As students on campus, you see this through the regular email reports of crime statistics on campus, which are available online at unlv.edu slash police slash crime hyphen log publication of the annual security and fire safety report, and timely warnings and emergency alerts regarding crimes or imminent hazards that have occurred on or near campus. Slide 39. Some of the crimes that must be reported include aggravated assault, burglary, homicide, hate crimes, motor vehicle theft, robbery, both forcible and non-forcible sex crimes, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, drug and liquor violations, and illegal possession of weapons. Note that this is not an exhaustive list. A full list of required crimes to be reported can be found on the clearycenter.org website. An incident involving any member of the UNLV community must be reported. When in doubt, we encourage you to report to the university. Slide 40. Let's talk a little more in depth about campus security authorities, which I'll refer to as CSAs. CSAs have a federally mandated responsibility to report any Cleary Act offenses to the institution. In addition to campus police and security officials, the law defines CSAs as any official with a significant responsibility for student and campus activities. Under this definition, all of your RSO advisors are considered CSAs and have a mandatory duty to report. As part of the registration process, all RSO advisors must complete a mandatory online CSA training, as well as complete the advisor agreement form, which acknowledges their role as a CSA. Slide 43. What's your responsibility as an RSO leader? As an officer or member of your organization, it's important that you lead by setting a strong example of reporting. As a member of the UNLV community, you have a responsibility to your fellow students to make sure that they are aware of any risk of crime based on what has already occurred. Report as soon as you are aware of an alleged crime so a timely warning can be sent to the campus community. Slide 44. Who can you report it to? If the person reporting the crime is in immediate danger or harm, call 911 or use your Rebel Safe app to be connected directly to the UNLV dispatcher. Other reporting avenues include UNLV Police Services, the Office of Student Conduct, the Office of Equal Employment and Title IX, Housing and Residential Life, the Care Center, Student Involvement and Activities, or your RSO Advisor. All CSA reports should be forwarded to UNLV's Cleary Compliance Coordinator. Reports can be made online.